1950, the Cold War was picking up steam. During the advancement of Soviet weapons programs, it was decided by President Truman and others in government that a new site was needed for the production of nuclear materials. These would go to the production of hydrogen bombs. The AEC Atomic Energy Commission and the E.I. DuPont Nemours Company announced in the December of 1950 that a new plant called the Savannah River Plant would be constructed on land near the Savannah River in South Carolina. The total area of the plant would amount to 310 square miles. The towns acquired by the government were Dunbarton, Ellington, and many smaller communities like Mayors Hill. Many of these were farming communities, and as such were not extremely large. However, much of what remains today is curbs and roads. The announcement of this plant was a shocking blow to the residents of these towns. You may relate to them if you imagine that the government was going to force you and all the population of your city or town to pick up, move somewhere else, and find new lives. There were some fears about this new plant that many held. This new site could pose the threat of a nuclear meltdown, which would be especially destructive to the state and the environment. The new plant could also make South Carolina a target of the Russians if war were to ever break out between the United States and the USSR. This fear that many felt was depicted quite well in a political cartoon created by a woman named Kate Palmer. Her comic depicts a woman, representing South Carolina, being handed a literal monster to take care of. Imagine having to take care of a monster that could release fire and destroy anything within the near vicinity at any moment. That is how many felt about the Savannah River plant. As such, the creation of the Savannah River site was a considerable conflict, as it would end up displacing about 6,000 people and thousands of graves as well. A few small compromises did arise due to this event, which include the creation of new jobs for the populace, a new home for the displaced. The reason so many towns were acquired by the government was for safety. The site itself would be in the center of 310 square mile area, far from any cities, towns, and farms within South Carolina. This final area was also a form of compromise, as it was decided that two towns, Jackson and Snelling, would not be inside the area, and so the citizens would not be forced to leave their homes. More area, however, was added from Allendale and Barnwell counties. This compromise and more to come was caused by the inherent conflict in forcing people who have lived in a single town they may have called home their entire lives to suddenly leave and start new lives elsewhere. Another compromise that would arise with the building of this plant would be about 25,000 new jobs for the populace, and the governor of South Carolina, as well as many other leaders, were worried that these people would actually be paid too much, so that the populace would not want to go to work for other businesses. Possibly the biggest compromise was the creation of a new town for the 6,000 odd people who were displaced. This town was called New Ellington. Although the government funded this town for the citizens, it wasn't quite enough, as the towns and communities they lived in before had much sentimental value. Many citizens would never occupy the space, and some even moved out of the state altogether. New Ellington never thrived, and all that exists today is a highway bisecting small stores and a shopping mall. The citizens willingly left their homes because it was for national safety. However, even when they are paid for their property, they are paid from a purely objective point of view. Any subjective value was not taken into consideration. Due to this, some felt that they were not paid enough for their previous lives. Can you tell us what you know about the Savannah River plant? Uh, only I can speak of as far as what my dad told me when I was growing up, because I was probably, I was born in Aiken, South Carolina, because my dad was working at the Savannah River Nuclear Power Plant. He was a millwright, and uh, he was pretty much there to help build the Savannah Nuclear Power Plant. Uh, a millwright is a person that knows how to put things together, move heavy equipment, machinery, all these type things. And uh, he was very skilled in that area. He told me that the Savannah Nuclear Power Plant was a facility 
that was helping bring forth uh, nuclear bombs and everything to for protection of the United States. The newspapers released stories on the construction of this plant and the displacement of the people who live there. Some were positive on the subject, some not so. One such publisher that displayed some outrage was the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. They released an article on, di on the displacement of these citizens and spoke about how some had to leave homes behind that had just been built in the countryside. Despite the obvious uncomfort for the 6,000 odd displaced people and some others, prospects looked good for this site. A quick timeline of these events goes as follows. As shown on the timeline, the decision to make a nuclear facility in South Carolina was made in 1950. As told before, it would be called a Savannah River plant. And in 1951, the construction of the plant starts and the displacement of the citizens is complete. In 1953, our reactor, the first production reactor, goes critical, marking the first stages of production for the plant. And in 1956, construction of the basic plant is complete. In the interim between the previous dates and the ones shown here, Many add-ons were made to the Savannah River plant. In 1972, it was made the first National Environmental Research Park. In 1981, the Savannah River plant began environmental cleanup programs. And lastly, in 1991, the Cold War ended and production of nuclear materials weapons stopped. Most of those who were displaced disappeared from history. However, some shared their stories. One such person was Luis Kessels who wrote a book on this event. This book is called The Unexpected Exodus and recounts her experience of the event, which occurred during her teenage years. Others shared their stories in interviews taken during the 1990s and early 2000s. These interviews were incorporated into a documentary called Displaced, which is available for purchase. These people tell of the struggles they had to endure during this time and how it affected the rest of their lives. The plant itself also had an interesting future. A laboratory dedicated to environmental cleanup and nuclear waste management was added on, and this plant has helped develop ways in which to manage and transport nuclear waste safely. This is mainly because of contamination of the area surrounding the site from poor handling of the nuclear material. Scientists in the plant started developing these methods during the 1980s as a response and to help with the transport of nuclear material in other areas of the world has, in fact, served a vital role in protecting citizens and the environment from deadly contamination. It continues to do so today, offering vital aid in protecting the citizens of the United States. One could even argue that the sacrifice of those displaced citizens went a long way in protecting many others. Those who are still alive from their displacement now would not have to feel badly of their displacement. They would now know that their sacrifice was not in vain, and has helped save countless other citizens from having contaminated water, food, and a contaminated environment in general. This plant has helped prevent many problems. Although it did not seem like it at first, the compromises made might be seen as enough because those displaced were moved away from their homes for a good cause, though they did not yet know it.